Um, welcome back, everybody. Another week, uh, and we've uh, we've left uh, we've left the the glories that are the ritual laws at Sinai and all the other laws at Sinai. Uh, and this week, we're moving on past Sinai to what happens after that. Uh, there will be more laws given uh, in the course of our time together. So many more laws, uh, but. Uh, what we're what we're dealing with in in these chapters that I, I asked you to look at uh, for this week um, was the uh, is, is not about the the laws. The focus turns to the people uh, rather than to God, uh, and it turns out that when the focus turns to the people rather than to God, uh, uh, bad things happen. Uh, it, one of the nice things about the material that we're reading for this week is that we're not dealing with just the sort of priestly stuff we had in Leviticus. All three of the sources of the Pentateuch uh, that are not in Deuteronomy uh, are represented in, in these stories. And yet, uh, they all seem to share a common understanding of what happens in the wilderness, uh, which means that these stories give us a, a good opportunity to talk about uh, a, a thing we call in the field tradition, uh, and which is a, really a way of answering the fundamental question of, despite the various sources of the Pentateuch at least these three, not knowing each other, uh, how is it that they all basically tell the same story? Or at least why do they all seem to agree that the wilderness was a problematic period? And at the heart of this is a common tradition. Everyone knew that Israel had to get from Egypt to Canaan. They don't agree on all of the various stops or the routes or even the specific experiences that happened between those two places. But they all agree that during that time, Israel was disobedient, rebellious, mistrustful, intransigent. Uh, scholars sometimes refer to this as the murmuring or the complaint tradition. Essentially, just across all of these various stories and various sources of the text, Israel seems incapable of like just being cool in, in the wilderness. And what makes this stories, I think, to me at least, particularly interesting, is how that uncoolness manifests in the different strands of the text. And perhaps unsurprisingly, what we see is each of the sources of the Pentateuch making the same basic move, but according to their own unique interests and perspectives. So what I want to do today is look at each of the stories, uh, these stories in, in the middle of the book of Numbers, to isolate in them what the, what the problem really is that the text is, is dealing with. Uh, I suppose that I should start, uh, and I, it's kind of a funny thing, it didn't, uh, I'm, I'm so, so used to talking about this stuff and we're already in, all the way into numbers, I figure we've all been through it all together, uh, but uh, all we've read together, this group, is, is, is priestly material, is Leviticus. Um, so I suppose I should start with like the basic literary historical premise of reading the Pentateuch, just as a quick refresher for, for some of you, uh, but I you know, lay it out fairly briefly um, for the purposes of today's conversation. But the Pentateuch is not a unified text, all written by one hand at the same time. Uh, it's a compilation of four distinct threads, four originally independent literary documents, and the one we've spent all of our time with so far uh, in this course is called P, the priestly source, P for priestly. Um, and we've seen, of course, how it's concerned fundamentally with uh, sanctuary and ritual and holiness, right? Priestly uh, issues. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to get to another one of the sources that's found in Deuteronomy, and we call it D. Deuteronomy, D. Um, and that source is not present in numbers or really anywhere outside of Deuteronomy, so we don't need to worry about it for a couple of weeks. The other two sources, the other two literary texts that were combined to make up the Pentateuch as we have it, uh, we call J and E for reasons that are too complicated and in the end boring uh, to get into here. Uh, so I'm not going to say uh, it's not important. Uh, the, the important thing is to know there's P that we've been dealing with, and there's going to be J and E. I don't need to tell you more than that right now. Uh, and I'm not going to say more than that at, at this point. As we go through these stories today, uh, we'll see how each one has its own hangups and focuses. Uh, and, you know, we're going to see as we work through these chapters, uh, why we think there are multiple sources in the first place. 
And that's true uh, of the first text that we will be dealing with, uh, which is right, Numbers 11. Uh, it doesn't take uh, too much expertise, I think, to see in Numbers 11 that there are two relatively distinct things going on in this chapter. Uh, there is uh, the people complaining that they don't have any meats to eat, right? Just this damned manna, which I suppose probably gets boring after a while. Uh, and to that complaint, we have the solution. God will send quails uh, to feed the people. But God is so annoyed at the complaining that along with the quails, he sends a plague. That's, you know, that's, that's one distinct thing that's happening in this chapter. And alongside that, and seemingly unrelated to it, is Moses' complaint that there's just too many people for him to be able to handle the burden of leading them all by himself. And for that, we have a different solution, which is the appointing of 70 elders to share some of the divine prophetic spirit with Moses. Once we recognize these two plot lines, the people complaining about meat and they're gonna get fed some quail and Moses complaining about not having any help and getting some help, once we have those two basic plot lines in place, everything else in the chapter basically falls into line. We just have to look at every uh, every bit and say, uh, which one of the stories does it go to? So I'm gonna, um, I'm not going to go through not at this point or at any point today. Am I going to spend time sort of going nitty gritty through how we do all the separation? You're going to trust me because we've built up trust over our time together. Uh, you're going to trust me, and I'm just going to tell you the stories. Uh, as, as they existed before they were combined into the text that we have. Here are the two stories in Numbers 11. Uh, in the first one, uh, the people uh, weep and complain right, about not having meat to eat. Uh, and they even start to think fondly of their time in Egypt. We remember that we used to eat fish for free in Egypt and cucumbers and melons. It's a very, it's a very nice diet. Uh, but the people are complaining, right? We're, we're out in the wilderness and this is the worst. All we have is the stupid manna. And then we get this very brief description of the manna that's not particularly important to our purposes, but it obviously follows on what came before. Uh, Moses hears the people weeping uh, and he and God get angry about what's going on here. Moses, however, uh, is sort of at a loss. What are we going to do? Where am I supposed to get meat to feed all of these people? Uh, when they whine and say, give me meat. He doesn't have a, Moses has no solution for this. He can't even think of one. God has a plan. You tell him when to get ready, right? I, I hear them. I hear them whining. Uh, I'll give you meat. Uh, I'll give you more meat than you could possibly uh, ever eat, right? I'm going to stuff you with meat. And in here is, I think, the, the key phrase for the story. You have rejected the Lord who is among you with your whining. Right? You're complaining about sustenance, and God is literally in your midst taking care of you. Right? What kind of, how are you going to complain about something like this? Now, Moses still doesn't quite get it. You're telling me uh, you can provide meat for this many people? This 600,000 people, I'm supposed to, you're, you're going to, uh, even Moses, it seems, doesn't fully trust God's complete power in this sense. And God gets a little annoyed, and rightly so. Is there a limit to God's power? You'll see in a second. So Moses goes and tells the people what God said, and here comes the quail. Right? A wind from the Lord starts up. Here comes the quail. A day's journey on this side. There's a lot of quail there. Um, and they gather it all, and there's a, there's a ton of it. But with the quail comes uh, a plague. And with the plague, the naming of the place after what happened there. Right? We'll call the place uh, Kivrota Ta'ava, which means literally the, uh, graves of the, grave of the graves of the craving. So this is like the, the story I just told you, a totally fine, <clears throat> excuse me, a totally fine little story. It's got a beginning, people complain. It's got a middle, a dialogue back and forth. It's got an end, everyone learns a lesson and dies. 
And note the main theme uh, at play in this, in, in this story. The people, and even Moses, don't fully trust that God will provide for them in the wilderness. This is a story about divine providence, about the people's mistrust of God's presence and care for them. Uh, this story is from the source that we call J. Uh, it's the same source. We get similar stories from the same source uh, back in Exodus. In Exodus 15, we have the story of the people not uh, having water to drink. In chapter 17 of Exodus, we again have a problem of there not being water. That's where you get the, the water from the rock. Um, uh, same, same basic language and issues, like what are we doing out here in the wilderness where we're not provided for? And God gets annoyed and is like, boy, these people, uh, I'll give it to them. But And so you, it, it's growing here. Um, divine providence, right? Literally divine provision in the wilderness. Uh, is God in our midst or not? That's Jay's idea of Israel's complaint in the wilderness, the people doubting God's presence and providence. The other story in, uh, in our chapter, in Numbers 11, uh, goes like this. Uh, just upon, right, they've just left the mountain, just as they're about to enter into the wilderness, Moses is the one who's got the worries. Man, this is a lot of people. Right? I'm supposed to care for all of them like I'm their mother. Right? Uh, I, I can't with this, right? Uh, he would say in, a, in sort of modern idiom. Um, uh, I just can't. Okay, so God has a solution. Tell you what, let's get 70 elders and we'll put some of their, your spirit on them and they'll help you with this sort of leading the people kind of thing. They'll bear the burden of the people along with you. And this is just what Moses does. He goes out and he tells the people, he gathers 70 elders of the people, he brings them to the tent of meeting, right? Uh, and he, God takes some of the spirit and puts it on the elders. Um, so terrific. And it, it turns out uh, two of the 70 who were supposed to be chosen, uh, I don't know, they got uh, sick. They didn't go to the tent with the others. Uh, I don't know why. But they're still, even back in the camp, they're still feeling the spirit of, the, of, of God, which uh, causes some confusion, uh, not least because their names are Eldad and Maydad and are probably, uh, you know, people confuse them all the time. Uh, there's some confusion about why they have the spirit of God on them, even though they're not out at the tent. Uh, but Moses makes it clear, you know, it would be really nice if everyone had the spirit of God on them like I do. That would alleviate my burden. We wouldn't have to worry about anything. Um, okay, so what's this story about? It's obviously shorter than the other one. What's this story about? It's not about meat. Uh, it's not about mistrust and divine provision. Right? This story, well, in part, this story is, I think, an ideological explanation for why there were prophets that existed in the world after Moses. Right? Moses is talking to God, he's leading people all by himself, and yet the people looked around like in their world that they lived in, they were like, there's prophets all over the place here. Where'd they come from? And this story so helped to, to answer that question. But within the context of the story itself, within the world of the narrative, uh, this story is uh, a comment on Moses's own prophetic leadership and the personal and perhaps social problems that arise when there's only one person uh, who is claiming to be acting according to God's will. They haven't even gone anywhere yet, and Moses is already wary of Israel. Uh, and this story, if the last story was from J, this story is from E. I hope that the color coding will help. J is in blue and E is in green. This story is from E, and this is E's main concern, the status of Moses as prophetic leader. And here it begins with Moses being like, oh boy, I'm worried about this. It's like the, the first stage of what we'll see is a multi-stage process. That's actually, I'm going to just, I'm going to keep going through the text. This is the same topic 
that E takes up in the next story in Numbers 12. Uh, and here in this story, it is a continuation uh, of the previous, at least uh, in terms of its, its source. Uh, here, the people who are complaining aren't the Israelite people as a whole, but Aaron and Miriam of all people. They open with a, a note of concern about Moses's wife uh, in a line that has vexed commentators for uh, centuries, uh, truly the number of theories about what is going on here and why they are upset about Moses's wife and what it means for Moses's wife to be Cushite uh, and who this person is occupy a ton, a ton of, uh, of commentary. And uh, I'm not going to bother with it here. Although I find it interesting and I, I have no uh, clear answer, nor is it enormously relevant because in fact, the real issue that Moses, that Aaron and Miriam are upset about is not Moses's wife, right? That's like their, uh, uh, that's like their excuse uh, for, for complaining about a thing. Because as, as soon as they say that, uh, they say, has the Lord only spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Right. How come God only talks to Moses is their complaint. Uh, after this, uh, this, again, is not really about the part of the, the plot issue, but the next line, I'm telling you before I put it on the screen, the next line in the story, in my mind, is the funniest sentence in the entirety of the Pentateuch, especially uh, in light of the, like, the longstanding belief that Moses himself wrote the Pentateuch. Okay, I want you to imagine Moses himself wrote the Pentateuch, and this is something Moses wrote. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than anyone else on the face of the earth. <laughs> uh, I I love this line. This is one of my favorite sentences. Uh, I, to be to be clear, this line is actually like in the 17th century when scholars started to be like, I'm not sure Moses wrote the whole thing, or at least when that sort of when people started accumulating more and more evidence along those lines. This line was act is actually one of the lines that people pointed to, and they're like. I don't think he wrote that one. And so, you know, that's the, the first stages. Okay, it's just a, a, a brief aside. Um, anyway, God comes down and calls out Aaron and Miriam. I mean, literally calls them out. Come to the, come to the tent of meeting and uh, they both come forward and God comes down in the cloud. And I bet this is terrifying. Um, and God says to them, yeah, there are prophets. Of course, there are prophets among you. Like, were you here a chapter ago? We just created 70 of them. Yes, there are prophets. Uh, I speak to them in visions and dreams. That's normal. Uh, Moses is different, right? With Moses, famously, it says, uh, I speak to him face to face, right? Clearly and not in riddles. Uh, and he actually like beholds the form of God, whatever that means. Again, the underlying issue in this chapter, like in the E story of the last one, is Moses's prophetic status. Right? Uh, what is his relationship uh, to God and how is it different from everybody else's and can anybody else access it and, and, and is it legitimate? All these things. The end of this story, I should point out, uh, has, uh, has Miriam being struck with skin disease and being shut out of the camp for seven days. Uh, and there is an obvious question to be asked here. Uh, how come Miriam gets struck with skin disease, disease when she and Aaron both complained uh, like at the same time using the exact same words Right, literally, they said, uh, how come she gets hit with it? And Aaron has to be like, oh, man, this is terrible for Miriam. Uh, Moses, please save Miriam. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go take a nap. I don't, like, why does Aaron, why is Aaron not get it? Uh, and I don't know the answer. Patriarchy, probably. Uh, but again, that's not, uh, that doesn't really speak to the, the overarching theme of the chapter. Is Moses the sole legitimate prophet for Israel or not. And here's the other two people who have the best claim to it. And they're told clearly, uh, no. At the center of uh, the texts read for today, at the center of today's text is the spy story, uh, which I think is certainly the, probably the most famous episode uh, from the wilderness. Uh, as with Numbers 11, it comes in two distinct tellings that have been interwoven. And again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to run through each of them in turn 
rather than dwelling on the how and the why of their separation. Uh, but some of the reasons why we distinguish them, distinguish them will, I hope, become clear along the way. Uh, I'm going to start with the P story. Oh, it's in red. That's my color for P. So green is E, blue is J, and red is P. And uh, red is uh, P is red because uh, blood is the answer to that. I don't have good reasons for the green and the and the blue. And to be honest, I inherited it all from my teacher. Uh, but but this is why uh, P is red. It's because of blood. Um, so we're starting with the P story of the spies. God tells Moses to send scouts, one from each tribe. Fine. Uh, and then we get this whole list of the of the scouts. I'm not going to spend any time on. Just let your eyes glaze over. There it is. And Moses sends them. And off they go, scouting the entire land from bottom, the wilderness of Zin, all the way up to the top, the Bohamat, which is right at the border of, uh, of the Aramean uh, territories to the north. And 40 days later, they come back uh, in good biblical 40-day style. Uh, but when they come back, and this is key, when they come back, they tell lies about the land, right? They spread calumnies in a word that no one has ever used uh, in speech before. Uh, they tell lies about the land. It's no good, this land. It, 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 de it devours its settlers. It's not, a, it's not a good land. And also, by the way, it's full of giants. And the Israelites, reasonably enough, are upset by this news, even though we know it's not true, but they don't, right? And they wish that they had died back in Egypt, right? Die, I wish we died in Egypt, we, we could even die in the wilderness. Anything is better than going into Canaan and dying there and being killed by the sword. Like, let's, uh, let's head back for Egypt. Or as my slide says in a very funny Italian-like mistake, let us head back for Egypt. I don't, I, that's just a typo, but it's a very funny one to me. Okay. Uh, by the way, this, this thing where the people wish they died in Egypt is another one of these patterned parts of the, of the tradition. Everybody has the people wishing that they went back to Egypt at some point in the wilderness, even as the episodes where that happens and the stories about it are totally distinct. So keep an eye out for it uh, as we go through. Uh, Moses and Aaron hearing this are upset, uh, naturally enough, but two of the 12 spies, Joshua and Caleb, they tell the truth. They're like, no way, it's not a, not a bad land. It's a good land. Don't be afraid of the people who live there. Right, we got this. Uh, the people, the rest of the Israelites, are not in a listening mood uh, and are, uh, are threatening to pelt them with stones. And God shows up, which is you know, an almost universally bad sign uh, in, in the priestly story when God shows up. Um, uh, and God's angry. I realize this is a ton of text on the screen. Um, God's angry. Okay. You wish you just die in the wilderness? Done. You said it, I'll give it to you, right? All of you who were recorded from the age of 20 years and up, not one of you will enter the land, right? Except Caleb and Joshua, right? Because they did the right things, right? Uh, your carcasses will drop in, this, in the wilderness, the whole thing. 40 days of scouting, so 40 years of wandering, the whole generation is going to die off. And as a denouement to the story, in case it was necessary, uh, as for the, the, the men who actually uh, Moses scout, sent to scout the land, uh, those who came back and caused the whole community to like have this problem by lying to them, right? The ones who lie, they died right then and there of a plague. Right? Everyone else can wait 40 years. Uh, uh, those 10 uh, die on the spot. Okay, that's the priestly spies story. Now, interwoven with that in these same chapters uh, is another spies story. Uh, and this one comes from the J source. Here it is. Uh, Moses sends spies into the land, not the, not the whole land, right? In P, they go from bottom to top, uh, just the southern parts, just the Negev and the hill country, uh, which auth authentically is really just like the first place that Israel settled. Uh, and so go ahead up there, just to that place, and bring back all the information and like uh, some nice fruit while you're at it, like a nectarine. Uh, and so, uh, so they do, right? They went up in the Negev, 
They came to Hebron. We get a little information about that. They come to a place called the Wadi Eshkol, where they cut down um, a branch and they bring grapes. Um, and if you get, uh, there, are, there is some, I know that there is an Israeli wine company that uses this as its symbol, right? The two guys with the pole with the grapes in between them. Um, I think it's Carmel. In any case, uh, that's what the, the image here is the, the spies coming back, bearing the grapes uh, with them. Uh, and they come and they make their, uh, they come back, they make their report. It's a nice land. It flows with milk and honey. Look, we got grapes. Uh, but the people are strong and the cities are fortified and there's like people who live there already. Can you believe it? In this story, the spies don't lie. They don't lie, uh, but their report is frightening to be sure. Right. This is like uh, right. The, the, the difference between the two stories, right? In P, it's actually a, the report should be good, but the spies lie. Why? I don't know. In this story, the spies tell the truth, but what they say is scary. But Caleb says, yeah, OK, but let's do it anyway, guys. Like, uh, we'll, we, can, we can overcome uh, all of this. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, where did Joshua go? Uh, well, that's another one of the differences between the two stories. Uh, in P, Caleb and Joshua are the spies who, uh, who tell the truth. In the J story, there is no Joshua. Why not? Because Joshua doesn't exist in the J story at all, ever, anywhere. Um, so uh, here it's just Caleb alone. Uh, and he's not saying, he's not saying, no, 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 I'm going to tell you the truth. What he's saying is, it's going to, it might be hard, but we should be trusting in God to, to, that we'll be successful in this. The other spies continue to be concerned that it might just not be doable. Uh, and the people are upset. Uh, and God is angry. You know what? Forget the whole people. I'm going to kill them off right now. I'm going to start again with you, Moses. Uh, and Moses, cleverly, as a response, plays on God's ego. God's uh, sense of his own reputation. You know, when the we just escaped from the Egyptians, when they hear that uh, that you uh, that that you killed them <laughs> in the middle of the wilderness, uh, uh, they're going to say things like, "I guess that Israel's God just couldn't finish the job." Right? They're going to think it's on you. Right? They're not going to they're not going to know all this story. They're just going to see that you couldn't do the thing you said you were going to do. And Moses even calls back to a previous episode from the J story back in Exodus 34, right? Remember, you said to me, you said to me on Sinai, right? You identified yourself as slow to anger and abounding in kindness. So like, uh, prove it. Fine. God says, I pardon them. That's fine. I won't kill them all, but none of these people are going to make it through the wilderness. They're all going to die. And look, and look how, how it's framed here. Right? They have seen my presence. They have seen the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness. And despite the fact that all I do is prove that I am here and that I care for them, despite that, they do nothing but try me and disobey me. This should remind us of the J story from Numbers 11 also. I've been with them. I've been providing for them the whole damn time, and they're still on with this stuff. Essentially, God here has reached the end of uh, the divine rope. This whole generation is going to die. I'll start again with the next one, except for Caleb. Right? Caleb, I'll spare. And now, God says, uh, even though, like, literally, this story takes place at the border of Canaan, right? They just sent spies across the border. They're standing right there on the edge. And God says, all right turn around, right? Back to the wilderness with you, right? It's brutal. Uh, but in, in, in sort of in a wonderful coda to the story, the people then prove that they haven't learned anything. Uh, they're like, right? Moses says to them, ah, we got to turn around. And they're overcome with grief and they start heading towards Canaan. Like God just said, turn to the wilderness. And they're like, we're going to go, they say, we're going to go to, we're going to go now, right? Sorry, our mistake. We're prepared now to go to the place that God said to go to. And Moses is like, are you, are you serious with this? You're disobeying again. 
don't do this, right? If you do this, you're doomed to fail because God won't be in your midst, right? Making the case as God has been all the whole time. When God is in your midst, God takes care of you. Now, here you are, you're going to go try this, but God's not going to be with you. Then you'll see what it's really like to not have God with you. But people are stubborn and they try anyway. And the ark and Moses sit there in the camp going nowhere, and naturally enough, they are duly routed. So again, lots of these same themes, same themes that we saw in the earlier J story, trust, presence, uh, provision. Uh, the last set of stories that we have for today, uh, the last set of stories for, is from Numbers 16 and 17. Uh, what happened to Numbers 15? Uh, everybody shouted all at once. Uh, the chap that chapter is, as it turns out, a bunch of laws uh, that don't concern us here. Uh, we'll come back to laws uh, next time. Uh, and again, in this chapter, in these chapters, number 16 uh, and 17, we have multiple strands interwoven. So you remember, in numbers 11, it was J and E. In numbers 13 and 14, it was P and J. Well, folks, that leaves us with only one more combination left. And it turns out that number 16 is a combination of P and E uh, and is probably one of the most obvious interweavings in the entire Pentateuch, uh, because in the end, it's really like two stories that seem to have almost nothing to do with each other and are thus relatively easily separated. And uh, you'll see as we as we go through them just how they have nothing to do with each other really at all. Uh, so first, the priestly story. Korach, a Levite, uh, gathers a bunch of other Israelites to challenge not just Moses, but Aaron too. How come you guys get to be the holy ones? How come you get all the privileges? Okay. Moses replies, you want to give it a try. Tomorrow, let's see who God chooses. Here's what the test is going to be. And you can almost see Moses like smirking. Uh, everyone take some incense and bring it before God. Uh, we'll see what happens. Now, we who just read the story of Nadav and Avihu in Leviticus 10 and the bringing of incense by the wrong people at the wrong time, we know or should know already exactly where this story is heading. While he's talking to him, Moses has an, an extra point to make. It's like, Korach, dude, you're already special. You're a Levite. You already have been set apart. You already perform the duties of the tabernacle and minister to the community and serve them, right? You've al you're already better than everybody else except Aaron, right? Like, you need more than this. You're not really, right? it's not Aaron you're challenging here. It's God who made the decision, right? This is, you could do better, be better right? Um, says, says Moses to Korach. One more set of instructions here again. Tomorrow, you and your company appear. You all take a fire pan, right? Everyone brings one. Korach, you bring one. Aaron's going to bring his. Everyone's going to bring their fire pan. We're going to put incense on it and fire in it, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get all set up. And Korach gathers the whole community against them, against Aaron and Moses, at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And this annoys God, right? All the people are gathering around to watch. What are they, all on Korach's side? I'm going to destroy everybody. And as is often the case, Moses intervenes and is like, come on, you know it's just the one guy. Right? Let's not kill everybody. Uh, and uh, fine, so the people will, the people will back off. Uh, God's like, fine, tell them to move away from the tabernacle. And he says, okay, move away from the tabernacle. And they do. And now that the people are gone, right, like, the climax of the story is one brief predictable line. A fire went forth from the Lord and consumed the people offering the incense. It doesn't take very much effort to see what the priestly concern is here. The complaint here isn't about God's providence. It's, about, it's not about Moses' prophetic leadership either. Right? This is cultic. It's ritual. It's sanctuary. It's priestly. So in, in a sense, this is, is a really terrific example of how a common tradition gets manifested in a particular specific way. P knows 
that Israel was rebellious in the wilderness. Everybody knows that. It's a, like a fixed part of the traditional story. But what does rebelliousness in the wilderness look like from a priestly perspective? It looks like a rebellion against the ritual orders instituted by God, because those ritual orders are like the entire idea of P. That's almost all there is. So that's the story P tells. Israel must have tried to challenge the priesthood. That's, that's the, the logic of what a rebellion looks like for a priest. The material in chapter 17 um, is a continuation of this idea and is entirely a continuation of the priestly stuff. It's probably a mixture of uh, what we learned in the last couple of weeks, P material and H material. Uh, not a big deal. They're all picking up the same basic theme. I'm not going to run through chapter 17 in detail the way I have been verse by verse on the screen. Um, but, uh, I, but to tell you like what's happening in this chapter, so you'll see how it's playing up the same exact themes. Um, uh, in chapter 17, first you have Eleazar, Aaron's son, uh, who like goes around to the corpses of the recently charred and uh, and picks up their fire pans and makes them into uh, copper plating for the altar, uh, so that there's a visible reminder that only Aaron's offspring should presume to offer incense before the Lord. Uh, so right, making very clear what the what the rebellion was about and what the issue is. Uh, and then, amazingly, the, the people are like, get upset at Aaron and Moses again. They're like, my God, people are dying everywhere. And God, again, is like, I'm going to kill them all uh, and starts a plague. Uh, but Moses intervenes, and his intervention is, I'm going to have Aaron offer incense in their midst until the plague stops, thus giving us like an object lesson in who it is that can, in fact, offer incense and th the benefits that Aaron offering incense, and only Aaron, brings to the people so that they learn that lesson. And if that wasn't enough, one more test in chapter 17. It's, as, it's almost as if the priestly text really cares about this issue. Uh, one more test. Every tribe is going to bring a staff uh, and place it in the tabernacle, and God's going to choose one. And uh, so they all bring a staff, and the next morning, uh, lo and behold, Aaron's staff has sprouted with various kinds of blossoms. And this staff now, like the copper plating of the altar from earlier, uh, will be a reminder to the Israelites. God chooses Aaron. That's what the story is all about. It's really, it's like a long discourse on the sanctity and legitimacy of the priesthood of Aaron and his sons. But this discourse on the priestly legitimacy of Aaron's family is couched in the narrative traditional framework of the wilderness complaint tradition. The E story that is interwoven with the Korach rebellion uh, in number 16, as I said before, is really wildly different. Uh, two guys, Datan and Aviram, rise up against Moses. Not Aaron, just Moses. So Moses sends for them. All right, you're upset, come, let's talk it out but they refuse. They lay out their grievance to him. You brought us to this crappy wilderness place and you think you're so great, mister. Now, there's a bunch of vocabulary and like idioms in here uh, that are difficult to parse. Um, should you gouge out those men's eyes, pay no regard to their oblation. I haven't taken the ad. Well, that one I make, makes, uh, makes sense to me. Uh, whatever you wanna make of the specifics of the complaint, right, the thrust is clear. Uh, the Datan and Avram are like, you, you, we're not listening to you anymore. And Moses is like, I, I did nothing wrong, right? I haven't taken it. I haven't wronged anybody. He's essentially saying to God. Uh, and Moses then, so he's like, all right, they wouldn't come to me. That was all done via messenger, clearly. Uh, I, and so Moses heads off to confront them. Uh, now you have to remember that uh, these two, Datan and Aviram, are just like they're two guys. They're two guys living among the rest of the Israelites. Uh, but something bad is about to go down. And Moses is like, everybody move away because I don't want anybody else to get hurt. This is just a two-man issue here. Now, the confrontation itself. They come out of their tents and Moses lays it all on the line. You guys don't think I'm a legitimate prophet, huh? You think I'm doing this for myself? 
and honestly, if they had heard Moses complaining at the beginning of the book, at the beginning of Numbers 11, where he's like, just kill me now, I can't do it, right? Uh, I think they'd, they'd, um, they might feel differently about it. But Moses says, here's how you know that none of this stuff that we're going through is about me, right? It's not of my doing, right? Uh, it's not of my devising. Uh, here's how you know. A miracle is going to occur. Uh, the miracle, of course, is the earth is going to open up and swallow you. <laughs> but everybody around is going to be watching, right? And he, that's who Moses is talking to. Listen, any, for anybody out there who's doubting me, if something crazy happens right now, uh, then you, you got to trust me. God sent me. And if nothing happens, then I guess not. And I mean, sure enough, you know, instantaneously that miracle occurs uh, and the uh, and the earth swallows it up. And I have a mistake in here because that's not supposed to say all Korach's people. Um, uh, but the earth opens them up, opens up and swallows up uh, Datan and Aviram uh, and, uh, and all of their families. Sorry, uh, the families go with them. Um, and it, you know, the people are terrified, but that's exactly the point, right? Like, uh, the people are supposed to be witnessing this. Uh, and again, uh, you can see how consistent E is in its understanding of the wilderness complaints from numbers 11, where Moses is like me leading all these people by myself is going to be trouble to numbers 12, where Aaron and Miriam are like, how about we have some of his authority? To hear in number 16, where some random Israelites accuse him basically of faking the whole thing. All of these stories, even in a building kind of way, they're all about Moses's prophetic authority. So what are we looking at here? As I come to my conclusion and move toward questions. What we're talking about here, and I offer these to you as a nice example, is one common tradition, Israel complaining in the wilderness. One common tradition, but it comes in three distinct flavors. And this is the essence of how tradition works. We have a commonly shared story, but everyone tells it in their own way. And what's lovely about it here is that not only can we see how the three sort of different tellings of the complaint tradition differ, we can also see how uh, each of these variations links up with the concerns of their source documents elsewhere in the Pentateuch, right? We've seen how the, the J material, the J complaining picks up on earlier J stuff, how the priestly stuff is clearly calling back to, you know, things we know about like uh, Nadav and Avihu, uh, right? They're, they're all, they're not independent things. They're part of larger stories, um, right? P is always concerned with ritual and sanctuary. E is constantly talking about Moses' prophetic status, like all the way back into Exodus. Uh, and Jay has this really this, I think, beautiful narrative arc of Israel worrying about divine providence and presence right from the moment they leave Egypt all the way through the spies story. Uh, what's particularly nice about being able to see all of these different takes independently as we have today is aside from being able to sort of isolate these different concerns, what I like about being able to see them independently is the reminder that despite their, how very different I think they are in their concerns, they're all included in the final form of the Bible. And in fact, there is no Bible without all of them, right? The wilderness period as we have it in our received text isn't about any one of these issues. It's about all of them, right? The wilderness is a, a sort of a fuller, rounder picture in the combined text. And in that sense, uh, even as our final text reflects these unique uh, earlier concerns, as a whole, it appeals to something broader, right? Disobedience and doubt can take many forms, as these texts uh, and stories show. And perhaps maybe it doesn't matter which form it actually takes. In the combined telling of this story, it's the disobedience itself that matters. So like even if none of these particular complaints resonates with any individual reader, this overarching idea of disobedience uh, that is, that is the, the product of the combining of all of these different ones 
uh, all these different particular ones, that overarching idea, I think, surely resonates uh, with everybody.